Welcome back to another weather and climate presentation. This one will focus on tropical storms and hurricanes. So the things that we'll be discussing in this presentation will be the different names that are associated with these tropical storms and why those names um, exist and really the locations in which those names belong. We'll talk about the development of these storms. We'll also discuss a couple different elements um, within them, such as how do we name them uh, and how does that whole process work. We'll talk about how they're measured uh, and how they're been you know they're, they're categorized on values, and we'll talk a little bit about that and a couple other little elements that deal with tropical storms. Uh, but for the most part, that's what this is about: hurricanes. So with that being said, let's get going. Well, to begin, well, what's in a name? Well, hurricanes have many names, all depending on the part of the world in which the storm originates from. So a hurricane can also be considered a typhoon as well as a tropical cyclone. So as you can see down here below, I have it categorized. Hurricanes, that name, uh, are given to storms that originate within the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific. Typhoons are considered the Western Pacific region. And then we consider tropical cyclones, Indian and Southern Ocean. So it just really depends on the origination of that storm is the name or that we traditionally give it to its formation. Now, that's not the name name of the storm because as you know, we, we often uh, give our storms names like Hurricane uh, or Typhoon Isaac and things like that. And so we'll see a little bit more about that. But that's really uh, the justification of, well, why when we hear like Typhoon Lagoon or Hurricane Harbor, you know, when you hear these different water resorts, it's like, well, are they really the same thing? And the answer is, yeah, essentially it's the same thing. Um, what's different about it is where the storm comes from. And then we'll talk some, there are some little elements within size and stuff that can also be depicted. Now, that being said, here's a great uh, diagram uh, that gives you know, that representation. This is a map of the world and showing a couple different things. One is showing the area in which these storms will typically form as well as the typical path of that storm. And other things that we can see is the name that's associated. So what's interesting about this is things that we've talked about before, things you might not remember, but we do, is that we find that traditionally storms, you know, because of the Coriolis effect, deflect to the right in the northern hemisphere and they deflect to the left in the southern hemisphere. So we have that clockwise, counterclockwise motion when it comes to these storms. So just, I mean, with the direction in which they're moving, obviously the actual direction of the storm within itself can be a little bit different. We'll talk about that. But we find that uh, in particular here that, you know, hurricanes, the path that they take because of their size and because of the spin of the earth, they do deflect towards the right in the northern hemisphere and they deflect towards the left in the southern hemisphere. So you can see that we've got our names of hurricanes here and we've also got our typhoons, cyclones uh, within these areas down there. So it kind of puts it in perspective. Then I picked this diagram, going back into what's a name, what's in a name is showing uh, you know, typhoons, cyclones, and hurricanes in the zones, and also, as you note, know, the actual times in which we see hurricane season. So um, I think that's just kind of an interesting piece because I think you probably have heard of hurricane season, but maybe not you know, recognize when it is. We can see that if you were you know, to visit Disney World uh, during you know, August to October, you know, not only are you dealing with the, the end of summer and you know, kind of that humidity uh, at that point, but you're also dealing with their hurricane season, uh, August to October. We find that down you know, within uh, mid, you know, essentially middle America and, and also parts of Mexico, that their hurricane season is between June and October. And you can see that you know, Australia is January through March. And so we get to see that there's a lot of different different spatial aspects of these hurricane seasons and really you know where does this originate from you know as we'll learn you know the fuel of these types of cyclones these very large weather systems uh, deal specifically with rising heat off of the ocean so it certainly does play uh, in roles with seasons and also with that you know, distribution of solar radiation so then continuing, I guess that this was interesting for 2020, the billion dollar weather and climate disaster diagram through NOAA. NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So they track all extreme weather. They track um, many different elements, within, especially when it comes into uh, oceanic studies, uh, sea level rise and stuff like that. But I thought this was very interesting because this is just the year 2020. And to see, you know, obviously we had these incredible you know, forest fires in Northern California and up into Oregon. Uh, we can see that there was a drought heat wave summer to fall 2020 within uh, western central California. But look, you know, on the east coast of things, uh, we have a hurricane, uh, there's a hurricane um, 
um, SAS uh, from August 3rd to 4th, uh, we can see that there were some additional hurricanes uh, that were very large and became land uh, landlocked, Hurricane Hannah, Delta, uh, Laura, Zeta. So we can see all of these things. We track all this information. And you'll see where these names and items come into play in a little bit. So right, so far all we've really just introduced is that we've got some, you know, several different names that really decipher, you know, describe the same thing. Uh, we also learned that they, they're found around the world and we also started seeing that there's actually particular zones. So if I go back to, again, this diagram and that diagram, you know, when as geographers we look at things spatially, do we see patterns in which these work? Yes, we can see that these are all considered within you know the tropic regions and more you know between equatorial and just above the tropics. They're not considered quite mid latitude because mid latitude are just a little bit farther north or south than these uh, these particular storms, these uh, cyclones themselves. So then that brings us down to uh, the energy itself. So let's talk a little bit about hurricane energy. So as mentioned earlier, hurricanes get their energy from warm waters within the tropics. We find that the water needs to be at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit on that surface in order for these to develop. Hurricanes also need uh, moist air through depth and a weak wind shear within that you know, air parcel itself. Hurricanes develop initially as weak tropical disturbances over the ocean, but as as we can see, this, this is a great diagram that I, I included here. As the uh, additional moisture and that heat begins to rise, we also have cooling uh, through adiabatic processes, which will then create you know, our cloud systems and you start creating this storm system. So it says here, as, uh, as surface load strengthens, moist frictional convergence, convection, and surface lows have positive feedback on one another. So low pressure meeting there, which means air is being forced up. It's being forced up through convergence, through air being forced up with one another, also through convection. Heat rises. So then it says the wind strengthens as the load develops, frictional convergence will occur, and a stronger convergence gives more latent heat or stored heat, which can then be used for other things, as we mentioned before, such as thunder, lightning, and also just Again, uh, you know, prolonging that, that evaporation process. And then air flows outward and Coriolis turning forms upper anticyclone. So the Coriolis effect is continuing to help turn these uh, upper anticyclones. So then we move into the anatomy of a storm. So this is a kind of a bird's eye view. You know, I think most of us, we've ever seen any form of hurricane movie or documentary, we know about the eye of the storm, which is a very, very extremely low pressure point uh, within that. But we see that spiral bands of thunderstorms are organized around a low pressure system. The surface winds will converge towards a central low, which work, works out to be very warm and moist. Not like warm and hot, but warm and moist compared to the surrounding air. The air aloft diverges around a central high. So what ends up happening is that once the air reaches the top of the storm, uh, it, it's able to move away, it blows away, and it diverges. So we can see in this diagram that we've got our spiral rain bands are, you know, are spinning within, in this particular case, uh, counterclockwise because it is a low pressure system. It's converging and being, you know, pulling itself into the middle uh, within that storm. And we can see that some air is being forced upward around uh, that band where we have a very low, uh, you know, very strong low pressure system in the middle in the eye of the storm pushing down. So we have lots of different elements that are working within one another uh, in that development. So here's another uh, example bird's eye view so we can see the eye of the storm, the outflow and the subsiding air within the eye and those bands as well. So this whole spinning motion, this is a great example of kind of how that works. In much the same way an ice skater spins quicker as their arms are closer uh, to their body, a hurricane also spins faster near the center than the outer edge of the perimeter. So, you know, if you think about it, looking at these two examples of uh, of an ice skater. So this individual, the arms are on the outside, you know, spinning sl at a slower rate than if you were to tuck everything in, see how fast as a whole body that this person is spinning. So we find that the center part of the storm spins faster than these surrounding areas. But that's just, you know, I don't know, I guess other examples you can use are looking at um, like the gear ratios on bikes and cars. Uh, the closer you are in, in the middle, the faster it has the ability to spin versus as it slowly gets pulled itself outwards, it you know, doesn't move as fast. So when things are able to pull themselves in, uh, you're able to accelerate that speed. 
And here's some additional diagrams. So again, more with that anatomy. Destruction is the most intense on the right side of a hurricane. Again, hurricanes are what we're finding specifically within you know, the Atlantic. Here's a diagram, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. So we've got this very unique distribution uh, that's developing here. And we have the storm right in the middle. Uh, speed and direction of the hurricanes, this, the, the whole hurricane itself as a system is moving towards Mississippi and Alabama. And the question is, you know, why is the destruction the greatest on the right hand side? So I'll wait a second while you think about it. Okay. so. Hopefully, when you're looking at this diagram, we can see that because the hurricane is spinning, you know, as itself is a low pressure system, counterclockwise, the entire storm itself is being deflected towards the right, but the storm itself is moving counterclockwise. Notice that the wind on the right hand side of the hurricane is what's being thrown outwards and being pulled in on the left hand side. So we find that the damage on land and within the storm is more aggressive or more intense on the right hand side. So we've got that, um, so what else we want to talk about? Let's talk about the eye wall replacement. This is an interesting uh, topic when coming to hurricanes. So a shrinking eye, or the center point of that storm, indicates the storm's intensification. So some hurricanes can even develop a double eye wall and as rain bands you know, contract and will continue to intensify. So kind of again, going back to that, that uh, metaphor or that analogy they gave you earlier about the ice skater and as it, you know as the storm or the ice skater is pulling themselves closer into the middle they can spin faster which intensifies the rotation same thing here the eye wall replacement leads to essentially the weakening of a hurricane winds followed by a renewed strengthening so what we're seeing in this diagram here is that we've got our inner wall here in the middle and we have an outer wall that's developing and so at some point they're going to merge together and you'll end up having you know again a faster spinning uh, vorticity now the names that we actually give to hurricanes, uh, aside you know, or these uh, cyclone systems, aside from just you know, those names we talked about earlier, but the actual name, there are six lists which are reused for the Atlantic-based storms. Uh, they are there are lists for every region around the world, but we're going to be most interested in our list is because those are the storms that we hear of the most. Now that being said, we've got these six lists. That, you know, that lasts six years when we rotate through these lists over and over again. Now, names typically do not re get removed or changed from the list, but occasionally they are adjusted and names will be removed. The reason being is that if a storm is of great magnitude and intensity and is incredibly destructive, uh, usually in, in honor of the people who were lost or just of the damage and things like that, they will remove the name uh, from the list and replace it with something else. So I guess that this was an interesting uh, you know, list of retired Atlantic names by the years. So like 1954, uh, Hurricane Carol and Hazel uh, were retired. Uh, moving into you know, uh, 2000, Hurricane Keith, the name, Alice and Iris and Michelle in 2001, uh, Katrina, Dennis, Rita, Stan, and Wilma, those were all retired in 2005. And then you know, on this list, the most recent 2011 was Irene. So we can see that some names were then replaced. Now what does that mean with the other names that are remaining? Um, well, this is the most recent list that I could find of the Hurricanes list names within the next six years from 21 and all the way to 2026. So the way that this works is that when we have measurable storms that we are watching, we give them the name, we start at the beginning of the alphabet. So in 2001, the first hurricane that will be, you know, that is observed is gonna be Hurricane Anna, then it goes to Bill, then Claudette, and Danny, and Elsa, and Fred, and Grace, and then it kind of continues to work itself through um, that list. So these are, so generally, <laughs> These are the lists that we deal with. Um, it's not it's not common that they will have to move. You know, if we hit Wanda and we got to start you know a new list. They'll they'll usually start back over at A again and start moving forward. But um, it rarely happens. But these are the list of names. Which if you look at it, there's a lot of great names on here. So you know, who knows? You know, Hurricane Ophelia in 2023. You never know. I mean, some years we don't even get maybe four or five into this. Other years we'll get all the way down to 10 or 15. So it's very interesting on how these names work. Now, other things that we do to classify hurricanes themselves is we give it 
a what would consider the the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale. So we say it's a category one, two, three, four, or five, and we give these hurricanes a you know, number very similar, like with earthquakes, with the uh, the Richter scale, the Charles, with Charles Richter from Caltech, where we're, we're measuring the magnitude and intensity of earthquakes. In this case, we're looking specifically at storm surge size as well as uh, wind velocity. So a category one uh, has storm surges of four to five feet and the wind is between 74 to 95 miles per hour. And so this is really how we categorize them. Uh, we often, you know, when if I'm sure you have remembered, you know, in recent past of hurricanes and you know the, you know, the hurricanes what they'll do is they'll continue to grow while they're on the ocean because as there's additional water available and that you know that heat is available that evaporation occurs and it continues to fuel these hurricanes but once these hurricanes hit the land that's usually once they hit the land they start to lose some of their velocity they, they lose their fuel so they usually become less in categories once they go over or hit a landmass but it's just up to that point is what becomes very important for us you know when it comes to just natural disasters so when looking at storm surges that just means that we're seeing that waves have now increased a, you know from high tide they're now another four or five feet higher, those waves, and much more aggressive than they were at high tide before. So when we're looking at a category five hurricane, we're seeing that the, the waves have now been increased 19 plus feet, that's a two car garage, and we're also seeing wind velocities of 156 plus miles an hour, enough that generally, as it says here, complete roof failure on many residences and industrial buildings, some complete building failures, Small utility buildings blown over and away. Uh, flooding causes major damage to lower floors of all structures near the shoreline and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, the nice thing, I guess you can say the nice thing about hurricanes is that we know a lot more about them now. And so we're able to prepare a little bit more when it comes to, um, you know, things like evacuations. You know, we're seeing that a hurricane's coming, you know, and are we able to move now? Looking in recent past, uh, I'm going to use examples such as maybe Katrina, because uh, that was one of the bigger ones in my lifespan that I remember very vividly. You know, we knew that Hurricane Katrina was going to make that impact within the Gulf, and we knew that it was going to really be incredibly devastating to places such as Louisiana because they have such low-lying elevation, and there's other elements as well. And so there's a lot of arguing about these hurricanes, saying, well, well, how come people just didn't leave? Like, you know, they knew the hurricane was coming. Why didn't they just leave? And unfortunately, you know, when it comes to natural disasters and, and hazards such as these, they're not equitable. There's no equity within these, meaning that it doesn't just happen to people who have money. It doesn't happen to people who just don't have money. It's, there's no line that's really drawn. And we find that, unfortunately, most of the areas that are affected greatly by this are very low-income areas that do not have the means or the ability to just pack up and go. Um, you know, so many people were not in a position where they could just, oh, a hurricane's coming, I'm just going to go, you know, jump in my car and drive a couple hundred miles away and not worry about it. You know, so these people, oh, that's all they have. And so, you know, when we think about places, you know, such as Puerto Rico or Cuba or whatever these other, you know, other areas in the Caribbean get hit with these massive storms, you know, people are like, well, but why didn't they leave? And the, the answer is they have nowhere to go. These people don't necessarily have places to go to. And, you know, and that goes from anyone, you know, right, anywhere around the, not just, you know, in those areas, California, around the world. If you think about it, if there's an emergency, where do you go? Do you have the means to be able to get on an airplane? I mean, think about this. When the uh, pandemic hit in 2020, uh, when places were selling small 20 ounce bottles of water for $7 a piece, when toilet paper was being, you know, for hundreds of dollars, could people really afford that? And the answer is no. You know, in time of crisis, uh, people, you know, don't think rationally and and don't help their community. And so, you know, when it comes to a lot of these situations, we all we do have the ability to prepare. We do have the ability to try to you know to build up to prevent and to work towards these. But the reality is. Are there the means to really support these changes and these movements? Um, which brings me into just talking about hurricane, you know, the greatest damage and loss and talking about these things. So the greatest damage and loss of life from hurricanes are found along the coast, specifically due to storm surges and the storms themselves. So this is, an, I, I honestly don't know what hurricane this was from, but um, I did find this image and I just thought it was, you know, terrifying. 
to look at. But look at the difference. You know, we have our before on the left and after on the right. I mean, these I mean, these homes, other than I think this one's might be okay, um, and so might this one. But really, everything, they're gone. They're completely gone. And that being said, not only is the damage there, but we're also going to have to consider the fact that these were flooded in probably 20 feet of water, so everything has been completely destroyed. I mean, even this high rise over here, but and I'm just trying to look at this real quick because I, I saw it when I, I think that this here, this roof goes to this house over here. So it got moved over. I think that's where that came from. So, I mean, when we're looking at this, it's, it, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, this is, I'm assuming, uh, based on this, this would be probably uh, along the East Coast, uh, specifically because the Longshore Current looks like it's going down towards the south. But you know, kind of putting it in perspective with us, uh, not that long ago, I think it was in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had some really great, really big storm surges from hurricanes that happened out in the Pacific and places in Ventura uh, and Malibu. A lot of houses were completely just washed off the mountain faces and off the beach fronts. So it does happen locally. So I want to speak about one hurricane in particular, one that you may not have heard of, but still is part of our history in 1900, so you know, over 120 plus years ago. Galveston, Texas experienced a hurricane that caused the greatest loss of life of any United States meteorological event. Over 7,000 buildings were destroyed and over 8,000 lives were cost. This, they think, was one of the largest hurricanes ever really observed at that point. So this is a very old map showing uh, where the storm, the eye of the storm, and the location uh, centralized there in Galveston. What's interesting about this storm is how far it continued to go, because generally hurricanes, when they hit the land, uh, they start to lose their energy, and they usually don't last a whole lot longer after that. Uh, this one lasted quite a bit. It was very large to begin with. So on average, it was, it was considered a Category 4. It, it was about 145 miles an hour at its max. Storm surges were between 8 and 15 feet. And after the storm, you know, made land contact in Galveston, the storm continued to move northeastern, uh, which makes sense because it's deflected to the right, uh, in which it went all the way to the Great Lakes and New England. And all of those places experienced extreme wind and extensive rainfall. Um, and then it didn't dissipate until much later out in the middle of the northern Atlantic. So this, this lasted almost a month which is not common. Most hurricanes only last a week to 15 days. And this one lasted, I mean, it formed August 27th and finally dissipated uh, on September the 15th of that year. And so, I mean, this was incredibly massive. The storm, um, you know, I was looking at some reports just when I was preparing for this and it was just very interesting because they were tracking the hurricane, uh, some boats, fishing boats saw it off of the coast and they saw that it had run right through the middle of Cuba uh, and they knew it was coming but they just, it, you know, they prepared for it but they didn't anticipate the storm was of such great intensity. So again, it was her, it was a category four. So if I guess go back to category four here, uh, more extensive structural failures with some complete roof failure on small residences, uh, major erosion of beach areas and terrain will be flooded well inland. Um, you know, again, wind between 131 to 155 miles per hour and waves 13 to 18 feet in size. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Uh, so I wanted to wrap up with this to just show some photos. So here are some photos from the Rosenberg Library of Galveston, uh, Texas. So these are obviously aftermath photos. I mean, look at this massive house. Uh, this is a big city street, these buildings. I mean, they're standing in at least two and a half feet of standing water, uh, which as we saw even with, with you know, Hurricane Katrina, because of how low the elevation is in some of these areas, that the water doesn't drain out. It has nowhere to go because you're almost at sea level. So that water wants to go downhill, but if it's already downhill, it just sets until it slowly works its way out. And it's incredibly devastating. I mean, you know, going back to natural hazards, we're dealing with water. So, you know, with a fire, fires are terrible. They burn through things, and then once a fire is done, you're done. But with water, not only are you dealing with just the mass destruction, but if the water stays, now you've got to deal with uh, fungi, you've got to deal with mold, you're dealing with a lot of other elements and things. And everything's wet, and it's just, 
I personally feel that when it comes to uh, personal damage and items like that, that we find that it's flooding is much, much worse. Uh, and it's so much more long term uh, in that process because you have to wait for the water to leave. In some areas, I mean, I just saw a video, a documentary on some flooding that had some storm surges that had lasted um, several months into in a certain area on the East Coast. And it's just incredible to think that these buildings that people had lived in for over, you know, families over a hundred years are now still three or four feet underwater from a storm that happened, uh, you know, months and, and you know, earlier. So, Whew. that being said, that is an introduction to hurricanes uh, and, and uh, what's also considered a tropical storms. So, the big main things, we talked about the development, we talked about the orientation, we talked about the names, we talked about the classifications, and we gave you a couple examples of hurricanes and their damage and what, you know, what was the, the, the cause and effect of those. So I hope that you know sparked your interest in researching hurricanes and you continue to you know further that conversation. Be sure to, if you find something out interesting or you remember a hurricane or you want to know something, be sure to comment below. Don't forget to check like. And if you have not yet, don't forget to subscribe. Again, thank you and we will talk soon.